Good afternoon, good evening, depending on how jet-lagged you are. Um, very nice of you all to join us after lunch. After lunch is always the hardest session. I definitely recognize that, especially if your lunch was slightly bigger than you planned, to, planned for it to be. We're super excited to show you some, uh, some of the stuff that we've been working on in the past uh, three, four months. I'm doing um, silly stuff with uh, conference badges and trying to learn from this. I want to point out you're at the embedded track. Our focus is operations, so we're approaching this from an operations mindset. There's definitely things we did wrong. Uh, please spare our feelings by only telling us in private, but you can definitely ask questions um, and learn in public. You know, feel free to um, we'll share the code. Feel free to fork the uh, presentation afterwards. Sorry, the code uh, or the presentation actually. Um, and go ahead and make changes, make improvements, and uh, share back. So, hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me all right. Uh, my name is Adrian. I live in Paris. I'm a former site reliability engineer turned solutions architect. And my name is Karim Stili. I'm a developer advocate for HashiCorp, where I focus on infrastructure and orchestration tooling, uh, Terraform, Nomad, well, pretty much those uh, things. Before joining HashiCorp, I worked on industrial IoT at the Amsterdam airport. Uh, if your plane was late, that was not my team, but I know the people. Uh, and if you have thoughts about this demo or anything else, welcome. Four minutes late. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Mike seems to be working. Um, battery is also good. Um, I'm at Case Utility pretty much everywhere. You're building up the suspension. Uh, so uh, let's talk about edge computing a little bit. So I want to start out with the dictionary definition of edge computing, which is really computing that takes place at or near the physical location of the producer or consumer of data. And the physical part here is what's really, really important. If you have a fancy data center or you know one of the CSP data centers, that's a little easily solve problem because you don't have to care about it, but in our case you do. Um, way before we called it edge computing, which is really a much cooler term, um, in the way we think of edge computing now, around the beginning of the 1990s, any CDN that had a point of presence, technically an edge location. You're producing data at the edge, you're consuming data at the edge. Um, we just didn't call them that way. Um, but we're not here to talk about the old stuff. We're here to talk about something much cooler, which is batch computing, which is uh, computing that takes place on your conference badge or event badge uh, using a single board computer, uh, e-paper, e-ink screen, sorry, e-paper, e-ink is the uh, trademark, you should not use that word, and uh, maybe a handful of sensors. And so really, the first thing I want to talk about is what brought us here and how we got from a uh, well, an idea that was like, could we do this? Should we, sh should we do this was never a part of this equation. <laughs> it was always a, a matter of like, could we do this? Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, we tried to mock up the conference badge the way we uh, understood it from the email that we had. Uh, the visuals slightly differ, but the idea remains the same. Standard conference badge, you've got a lanyard, some conference branding, a QR code, so you can connect with people, name, uh, and of course, you know, the type of ticket you have. It's nice, it's easy to print, easy to reprint if you went a little too hard at yesterday's after hour parties. Uh, completely analog, no fanciness, nothing. There's zero, you know, security to this. So I think we're gonna change a few things. So first thing we're gonna do is, um, we want to keep the conference branding, so we're going to create this in a way that we can reuse the, um, the conference. And we don't want to have everything be digital because the more screens you add, the more power consumption you have. We'll talk about that in a bit. So we're just going to make this a nice frame. We've got some prototypes. Some of them shipped uh, and did not break. Some of them did ship and did break. Uh, but um, we'll show them later. Of course, replace the heavy stock paper in the printed part with a low-powered screen. In our case, um, well, we didn't go for full-color display because uh, carrying around a full-size battery pack is way less fun than a single uh, battery. And let me see. Last part, reusable frame. 
nice stickers that he can remove and add. I was kind of hoping we could, uh, we f would find the time to put some of the penguin stickers on there just to make it look the part. And that's about it. And flip it over, Raspberry Pi Zero Two. Single best computer you can get for 15 bucks. Uh, 4,000 uh, megahertz, 512 megs of RAM. Um, what else? Um, uh, let me quickly go here, there we go. Oh yeah, 40 pin GPIO, very important. 26 is hell to work with because you actually need to rethink all the stuff you're doing. And all in all, pretty sweet development platform. If you lose this, I mean, let's be honest, most of us are here because our employer paid for the ticket. So uh, you're not gonna be worried about those 15 bucks. Uh, we'll install some software on it. Uh, we're using Nomad, which is one of the products we use. You can install other tools on it. Uh, we had somebody challenge us and say, could we do this with uh, shell scripts? Still waiting for that pull request, but it's probably possible. Um, and of course, battery shield, because ultimately you want to update things and compute kind of needs some power to, uh, to do stuff. So front and back, standard conference badge, and um, that's where, we, uh, where we're starting out. So we definitely need our name and QR code on there. So we're gonna keep that from the original badge and make sure some events uh, use a QR code to check you in. So we wanna make sure the, the venue can still say, you know, like, yes, we, we recognize you based on this uh, with their Eventbrite scanner apps or whatever you have. And we like to call this the wearer screen, which obviously reflects who you are. And this brings a couple of fun problems with it. Right now, all of our badges are to totally unsecured because we haven't attached the fingerprint sensors. But we'll talk about that in a little while. And of course, it's computing, right? Why stop at one screen when you can have infinite number of screens? Uh, we could draw anything on this screen that we can calculate in terms of shapes. Uh, we stopped at three because math really is hard. Um, so on the left side, We've got the Nomad screen, which basically tells us about our compute devices, basically re relevant information. Is the software that we need running on the badge? Is it doing what we need it to do? And um, what version of the software we're running? And of course, on the right side, we support currently three different screen sizes. Uh, we want the software on its own to tell us how it is configured because um, what you're seeing here is the 2.7 inch display with uh, version two. Adrian here has uh, version one. Uh, and then we also have, despite all screens being shipped from the same seller at the same time, a version 2.1. They all have slightly different ways of communicating, which brings problems with it, a lot of them. There's many problems here. We started to think eventually that maybe paper was the, the better choice because paper is well understood and honestly a cups driver is, uh, is a lot easier than dealing with um, suboptimal e-ink in e-paper libraries. But as any engineer, uh, if you've seen the Martian, you know, you sometimes you just have to over-engineer the, um, the shit out of things. Uh, so uh, that's what we did. And just looking around here, can tell many people here are very versed in the idea, in, in ideation in software, possibly the hardware space. It's Friday evening, your sprint is done. You're like, maybe we can make this one change, upgrade a few libraries, add this extra thing to just make it a little bit easier on Monday. Yeah, that's where it all starts. It really sucks. When you're building edge computing uh, devices, not all hardware is equal different revisions from the same vendor, shipped in the same shipment, no matter if you're buying three or 300. Uh, it's not like you know, you're ordering your MacBook and your buddy's ordering a MacBook and you get the same device. No, your vendor is gonna ship them from separate factories. Uh, for the Amsterdam airport, we would get badges of, batches of um, 5,000 to 10,000 devices. And there was a human involved in testing all of them. Uh, if you were the intern for that, I'm very sorry, but um, it was very important work because while the paper says this is an occupancy sensor or a temperature sensor, you can never trust that it is actually 
what it says on the, on the tin. The firmware might not have been upgraded correctly. The um, firmware might actually be corrupted. A lot of that goes through automated QA, and if the system boots up, usually QC passed, nice little uh, hologram sticker on there, and ship it off. That's what you get from buying uh, from the cheapest vendor and not the best vendor. And so, problem here is also that this isn't the cloud. I can't spin up software-defined instances that are 100% identical. And even so, if you've done any work in AWS, Azure, GCP, you know no two compute instances are literally the same. The API defines them as the same, but you're not going to get the same thing. Which brings us to the first problem. We need to be able to target our software correctly. And a couple things that we have to do there is Raspberry Pi zeros are um, 64 bits in our case. Previous versions, 30, what's a yeah. zero one? Zero one was 32, thank you. We want to make sure our software actually gets targeted to the right devices. If you're writing in Go, you know that you're building for s uh, specific um, CPUs. Generally in software, you would do that, uh, especially when you're compiling. And you kind of want to make sure that you're only sending workloads to a target if they are actually eligible for that workload. Especially if you have low-powered devices, no shade to Raspberry Pis, they're actually very high-powered for what you're getting. But there's a lot of constraints around that. Uh, OS type, OS version, um, of course, uh, then hardware support. We're talking about a device here with e-ink screens. We're talking about a device here that might have fingerprint um, reading support. We want to make sure all of that is present before we tell our system to de deploy a binary there and run that binary. Device fingerprinting, always a good way to figure this out, especially if you're doing large-scale deployments, because in reality, you're going to run into situations where, especially if you're doing not necessarily batch computing, but say you're deploying an occupancy sensor that measures how many people are in this room, you're eventually going to want to have histograms of this room, you're going to want to have larger data collection, but your sensor is going to break down, so through fingerprinting, you can figure out which sensor got replaced, and actually continue that data collection in a realistic way. And then, my personal favorite, uplinks. In the cloud, stuff is easy, right? Your VPC, you set it uh, to 000 slash zero. Your uplink is there, and it works um, on your mobile device, on your edge computing device. If you have Ethernet, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, if you have Wi-Fi, that's still very acceptable not always going to give you the best experience. You might have some fallback uplinks, 4G, 5G, um, GPRS. Uh, if you remember the, the first few generations of Kindles with um, data connection plans, same idea. Uh, and you might not actually have anything as high powered as that. Uh, if, especially if you're working in industrial IT, generally you don't want to have Ethernet because things get a little harder. Uh, Large-scale places, large-scale deployments like an airport, we use LoRa, great protocol, 10-mile uh, range. Depending on who puts uh, aquariums where in your um, setup, but also not the same bandwidth that you get from your standard Ethernet cable. And then the fun one, power. Plug in your computer or your computing device, things work until you have a brownout. If you run on battery, things get a little bit um, harder. So before we jump into the next part, I want to give you the only commercial slide that we have, which isn't as commercial as, as it looks like. We're using Nomad on this because one, it is what we know, and two, it is what we've seen a lot of people use for cool projects. Again, you're free to use bash scripts, and I really want to see that implementation. But for us, we wanted something that wouldn't take up um, all of our resources and no much fit the bill, because it is specifically built for this kind of um, edge workloads. You've got people using it uh, at Roblox, at Epic Games, but the beauty is uh, it also works with uh, stupid stuff. I think that's, uh, that's really where it's key. 
Um, so I think, let's talk about constraints. Yeah, let's show some code now and how uh, actually we can do the stuff that Karim just mentioned. So this is a Nomad job. It's a bunch of HCL, the same language as Terraform, so it's relatively easy to read and write, no uh, space-based logic, which is great. Uh, the first bit is only um, yeah, the region data centers notebook is explaining where the, the workload should run. Like in this case, it's going to run on this uh, Raspberry Pi right here. And then we can use uh, more specific details to target really in depth, like we have constraints, so we can target the architecture because we want to run only on 64-bit recent um, ARM Linuxes, and we can also use custom metadata, like in our case, we're targeting only devices which have uh, enough battery capacity and have um, yeah, batteries which are in good health, which is important because we don't want the device to just die. We actually want to uh, catch that before it dies. And speaking of batteries. We're still doing okay with the uh, batteries. <laughs> but yeah, let me uh, talk a little bit about that. So when you're building edge computing devices, usually you don't end up getting the standard batteries. Uh, your belt pack, your microphone belt pack might have them, AAA or AA. Uh, for us, we end up using um, NR1865 batteries. Uh, these are fun. Your airline definitely does not want you to check those into the hold uh, because these are not protected in the same way a normal battery is. But you also get slightly more juice out of this. Uh, this one is 3450 uh, milliamps, um, consistent power for, in this case, a human machine interface, um, Raspberry Pi 4 compute module, uh, with two of these can run for up to 12 hours. My MacBook cannot handle that. Um, we're pretty happy with those. So, I know it's after lunch, but we're gonna do some interactive stuff. Who here knows the formula to um, calculate battery um, runtime? You're at the embedded track. Somebody has to know. Otherwise, we're just going to be making this up. Uh, well, the first approximation is after the battery has been in a watt hour or something like that, then you divide You get stickers. <laughs> Love it. And a happy face, yes. Um, so throw this into the formula, and one of those batteries can power a Raspberry Pi 2 at standard utilization, which in our case means we get rather decent Wi-Fi for almost the whole conference day. Honestly, that's, that's pretty impressive for a single battery, especially uh, if you have a couple of other options that help you fall back to if the hardware breaks. And of course, when the battery fails, um, we're working towards a beautiful future where telling your kid you should not eat batteries is no longer a concern. We're switching away from toxic stuff. Um, this was published last year. It was not published on April 1st. I, when I read it, I had to read three other sources that confirmed the same news because it did not seem like it could actually be the case. But yes, edible batteries are coming and it's going to be great. extra spicy. The, the one thing that I'm worried about here is like, where does the USB cable go? <laughs> Which brings us to connectivity. Uh, in this case, wireless, but um, yes, for batteries, obviously there's a hard wire uh, usually. Well, I guess you could do um, induction charging through the battery that you swallowed. D there's many bad choices uh, that were made here. but. Not all your workers and not all your edge devices might actually have healthy back, uh, backhauls. We're at a conference here. Um, if you were here about an hour ago, Wi-Fi dropped for everyone. It happens because keeping a network up and running is actually really hard. Uh, for the airport project, we had a company come in that had done three airports before. You would think they would understand how to roll out these networks and how big pillars that keep you know, buildings from collapsing would affect wireless um, connectivity. They failed and they basically had to double all their devices. Great for them because they get paid more. Not so great for us. I think um, 
you should talk about some connectivity stuff. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of things to consider with regards to connectivity, like how to architect the workload the application that we have so that it uh, can work in the connectivity constraints that we have. So it should be local first. It shouldn't have uh, cloud dependencies built in. Uh, for a fun counter example, a couple of years back, there was an AWS outage in a region and all Roombas stopped working, which well, shouldn't, doesn't make sense, but it, it, was, it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, there should be limited connectivity. There shouldn't be a hard dependency on the cloud provider. Um, it should degrade gracefully in case there is no connectivity and it should uh, yeah, try to do everything as much as possible locally. It should also handle those reconnects gracefully, not restart because there is a, oh, I'm back online again, so I'll shut everything down. Again, doesn't make any sense. Um, it should support multiple different um, connectivity types. So here I mentioned 4G, 2G, uh, LoRa, you know, whatever you have. And um, yes, exponential backup is a very good thing to have to avoid thundering herd. Uh, because yeah, when you have an outage, you don't want all potentially tens of thousands of devices reconnecting at the same time uh, because that will not make the outage easier. And um, data again should be handled gracefully. There should be the duplication. There should be um, graceful handling of the life cycle to avoid that yeah, in case of an outage, uh, all devices start overwriting their data and do weird stuff. And um, there should be, ideally, if possible, a continuous obs observability of the uh, connectivity and the connectivity outages to be able to improve them. Uh, like, for instance, if it's an airport, you control the networking, you know if you have a device which every day loses connectivity, you can do something about it. If uh, you operate trains and your tra trains pass through the middle of the forest and lose connectivity there, not really much that you can do. You can't really pass internet in the forest. You can try. Um, yeah, so as you've seen, like here I mentioned, there was a Wi-Fi outage in this room an hour ago, um, especially at big places like conferences, hotels. Often there is connectivity issues like from laptops. You get some lag, you get some uh, connection drops, uh, package loss, etc. And you can imagine how much worse it is with a miniature device that doesn't even have a proper Wi-Fi antenna. And uh, yeah, this was taken a couple of days back in a hotel. So as you can see, most of the Wi-Fi um, channels are pretty occupied. So you're going to have some connection issues in general. And I don't know where most of you are staying, but in the Hyatt uh, that Hiram is at, um, the the Wi-Fi in the lobby hasn't been working the past two days, uh, and you don't want such connectivity issues, be they in a hotel or in a conference room or in the middle of the forest to impact you and to force uh, yeah, restarts or things breaking. So everything should be as graceful as possible. So from the scheduler point of view, how do we handle this with Nomad? There is a specific configuration which you can use to uh, basically say, it's fine if this is lost. Like if we lose this node for, in this case, it's four hours, we don't care, it's totally fine. Uh, but after two, you should stop it because it's lost, it's been away from the control plane for some time. There's probably been updates that were missed, like the pricing is no longer correct or uh, the beverages list on the train is not correct, so please stop it afterwards. Um, so everything is as graceful as possible from the scheduler point of view but also uh, hopefully from the application point of view. And of course, as with uh, everything, if you do not observe it, it did not happen and you have no way of improving it in any way. So uh, everything should be observed, everything should be collected. Again, uh, gracefully, if uh, connectivity is lost, it shouldn't crash because it cannot send the metric somewhere, but there should be metrics to know yeah, what the net connectivity is like, um, what, uh, how stuff is, how stuff is evolving, so we can make good informed decisions based on that. I want to add to this one. When you lose connectivity, your device is still going to be producing data. So you have to have storage locally that can buffer that data. So that also means 
working across teams, working with your hardware team, working with your software and your networking team to figure out if we're going to lose connection for four hours, because that's the SLA the team guarantees to have this network back up, can we actually store enough data on the device without losing it? Ultimately, something like an occupancy sensor, location sensor, you want to have that data. Even if it's delayed, the late data is still better than no data. So that calculation gets really, really tricky because obviously, well, with a Pi, the question really is just what kind of SD card is in there. But with other devices, if you have access to SSDs, storage becomes a lot cheaper. Power usage becomes a lot more expensive. So these are all the considerations that you have to factor in there. Monitoring definitely helps and makes it a lot easier to predict where you have to go. This is, any hardware project will never be a one and done kind of deal because you're always gonna learn new things and as you're replacing hardware, hopefully improving the software that you're running on. Yeah, I think that's you still. Um, yeah, with regards to the applications that uh, you're going to run on the edge, actually. So, um, the quality of the applications might not always be the great. Like, even if it's you that is developing them, you know that you don't always have all the time in the world to make everything as uh, good as possible, as uh, well tested as possible, as we saw in the previous session. So, uh, yeah. But there's still stuff that we should try to do as uh, best as possible. So a uh, couple of application patterns uh, for stuff that is important to have and to do properly, as properly as possible in any case. So um, applications should be flexible, should be possible to do some live modifications on them to um, be able to debug them more easily and to be able to have um, flexible functionality that if a small component is not currently working, the whole application doesn't crash, we can still continue to do the rest of the stuff just fine and retry until it's uh, back up and running. Um, yeah, graceful degradation, we should be as tolerant as possible to any sorts of failures, be they on the connectivity side, uh, on the storage side, or on any sorts of um, dependencies, be they external or internal. And yeah, easier to deploy. Uh, again, observability, we mentioned this, but it's super important to actually know what's happening with the applications, uh, how they're running, to uh, be able also to predict maintenance, like we know that the batteries need changing every six months, so we change them five months and a half, not wait until the device is dead and somebody has to rush in in the middle of the night to actually change the battery. And uh, digital twins, uh, super important and nice to have. And um, Replaceability, so the ideally stuff should be as modular as possible to be able to swap components easily without having to recode, recompile everything. Um, and yes, data inheritance. So I wanna give you three, actually two concrete examples for these. Easily replaceable, beautiful, if you can put that on your flyer, if you can sell a product that is actually easily replaceable, uh, we work with a company called eFishery. They deploy water quality sensors in uh, the middle of Malaysia, and they're deployed to farmers who are not experts in embedded hardware. They get a little box, uh, if you've ever seen um, Pelican cases, kind of like that, nicely sealed, one cable coming out, that cable is for power, and the box can get submerged, preferably not, but that's all they have to deal with, one cable easily deployable. The rest happens automatically, hopefully. The gateway they deploy, of course, has a couple more cables, uh, network and uh, power, and then a backup um, backhaul uh, based on mobile data. But those are the ones the company deploys. The farmers, when they add a new fish pond or need to replace sensors, something happens, they just chuck a new suitcase there, plug in the power, and that's it. That kind of utility is insanely hard to get from a hardware perspective. Uh, sorry, that kind of ease of use, not utility. Though it is very utilitarian uh, when you limit all the steps that are required to, uh, to that level. The other part that's worth thinking about, and 
we'll, we'll share the link for that one later because um, personally, I think it's one of the coolest projects that I've seen. In 2022, that company deployed this to, I wanna say 50-ish farms using Raspberry Pi 2s. So 2022 using 2012 hardware uh, to make commercial operations viable. And the reason for that was really the cost of the device. If you found one of those sensors and decided to take it with you despite not being a fish farmer, because you like free hardware, I mean, who doesn't? There was no huge loss for the company. Raspberry Pi Zero Twos, uh, sorry, Raspberry Pi Twos were also very easy to get at bulk rates, especially you know, 10 years after they were introduced because everyone wants to unload their stock, which makes it easy to replace. And I think that is really, really powerful. But you don't always have access to all the hardware that you need. Sometimes, I think uh, Rob brought this up uh, very well, mock the things, build a digital twin. You're never gonna be able to mock everything, but even if you can just mock 20%, that's 20% that hopefully you don't have to test with the actual hardware. We don't have to constantly solder cables, replace sensors, end up you know, cutting your fingers, um, especially if you're new to hardware or new to um, heated uh, devices, things like that. Uh, similarly, anything we can test through software, we can usually automate. Realistically, there's a lot of repetition in this pattern that Rob already talked about because it is the right approach. When two people tell you at a conference, you know you have to do it. It's a, it's a universal rule. There you go. Thank you. Um, payment later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, of course, the replaceable part is, is really, really important. Data inheritance is key to this. We, we mentioned this before. Make sure you have a good way of creating that family tree of thinking of this location, not so much as this uh, device. If you're taking that fish sensor, it's assigned to pond 37 out of the 50. And whether that's device one or 50 should not matter because ultimately what matters is the data you're getting. So figure out a way with your data team, data science team, on how you can make that work. It's hard. There's gonna be a lot of trial, but it is worth it because ultimately, if you don't have breaks in your data, you can provide better service, whether that's getting people faster to the airplane, whether that's figuring out why your fish are dying, or whether that's figuring out you know, how, um, how delayed your train is. And now that we have all these best practices in mind, we didn't use all of them, we used most of them, but let's have a look at how we um, put this together. Uh, so we put, we start out with a Raspberry Pi Zero Two, uh, connect an e-ink screen to it. And of course, e-ink is common technology, especially if your drivers suck or you are not really good at uh, Python because then your screen does nothing. Uh, but as with any software, without the drivers, uh, not a lot of good stuff happens. So, and I apologize for the wall of text that's coming your way. Uh, it is uh, functional code. It is not well-written code. The library we use is uh, Python code, so we had to write a few lines of code to um, drive our screen, um, and maybe a few lines more. And eventually, uh, I think um, we ended up with uh, something that looked a little bit like this. I wanna say like 1,500 lines later. As with any over-engineered project, um, we went off the deep end. There's an HTTP server running on this device. Of course, it's HTMX powered because, I mean, do you really wanna run React on your Raspberry Pi? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> for the compute module, definitely for this one, we wanted something lightweight, right? Like lightweight hardware, your, your framework should also be lightweight. Uh, and it gave us pretty much this uh, screen. And so if we uh, bring this into hardware, uh, in this case, we're using a 2.7 inch display. Uh, we got the scale logo in there. We didn't get the penguin in there because, well, 176 by 264 pixel display does not do well with that stuff. Um, we did get some other stuff in there. And yes, after we took the screenshots, the 
pictures, we realized that maybe our automatic font sizing was not as smart as we thought it would be. Um, Chat GPT also could not help with that because math is really, really hard. But um, all these values we populate automatically. And yes, the size eventually works out. So we got all of them running and ultimately started building our prototypes, one of which we, um, we have here, one of which that didn't break uh, in transit, which is very important. And so you might be wondering at this point, so conference badges, badge orchestration, job orchestration at the edge, um, workloads, where are they going with this? I mean, I certainly had that uh, question. You came here because you probably thought, well, I want to have the problem of running compute on my badge. I mean, it is a very, very first world problem, but it is definitely a problem that we all have. It's not about conference badges. It never was. It's very much about fault tolerance at the edge, figuring out what patterns work, what patterns don't work, and how you can apply this to the rest of your engineering. The beauty of embedded projects is that you're crossing those boundaries, not just in your traditional skill as a software engineer, in having to figure out formulas that you probably learned in elementary school and, and forgot about, like how do I calculate how long my battery is going to last? Uh, your iPhone's stopwatch is not the correct way. We may have tried that. It was not as efficient as actually calculating and predicting it and then setting alerts for when it should happen. All this stuff that you learn when you play with hardware and eventually commercialize hardware, which is obviously the goal, uh, will teach you to be a better software engineer because you're faced with constraints that make you re-architect the way you're building things. A good example here is uh, the, the train is actually an easy one because it always comes back to a hub, usually. Nine out of 10 trains definitely come back to a hub. But imagine an edge deployment of digging devices, um, excavators, things like that, that are far away in a forest, they get flown in, um, with large cargo planes, McMurdo is, I think, a good example. You can't easily run updates there. You could, which is going to be really cold. So at that point, you have to think about the software and the end use of the software. You can train the people that are there, but the harder you make it for them, the harder you make it for yourself. Not just from a commercial aspect. Obviously, if you deploy your stuff, it breaks, and nobody can fix it until the next uh, shipment comes in, shipment of people, that's a problem. But it's also, it creates a problem because obviously the hardware, software was deployed to do a job. So we, we almost hammered on this topic. The graceful degradation is really what's key here. If your sensor can't connect, you know, at a one minute interval because it doesn't see your network, Exponential backoff and retry is great, but think about how you built that. Don't just always increase the timer. You know, we're going to do one minute now, then we're going to do three minutes, and then five minutes, because eventually that's going to be 65 days. And, well, the next one is going to be 130 days. And that's a little bit of a problem if the pings are that far in between. Have randomness in there so you can easily try and restore the service. And I think, as you mentioned, the randomness also will help you from creating a network effect where 10,000 devices that all lost connectivity all reconnect at the same time. Your lower network won't like that. Uh, most of your routers are not gonna, most of your routers and switches are not gonna like that either. So there's a lot of things that you have to architect for. The beauty of working with hardware, especially if you can touch it, Anytime you have a cable, just rip it out at random moment. See what your software does. Obviously, don't use the power cable unless you're wearing insulated gloves. Um, but play with the hardware. Hand it to somebody who's not trained to use the hardware. See what they do with it. If you're working, um, well, let's take UART cables. Uh, anytime you have pins exposed somewhere, 
see how you can restore them when they get bent. I'm sure that's only a problem that I ever have that my um, GPIO pins get bent, but it's hard to restore them. Oftentimes, you'll end up unsoldering or desoldering a header and then resoldering it. At $15 a device, um, I know better ways to spend my time, which is that device now no longer has GPIO support. It might still serve other purposes, though. So as you're building larger deployments, almost think about the graph of devices you're building. We've done this in software engineering. I think um, uh, DAGs, uh, direct um, acyclic, Acrylic? DAGs, the, the graphs are very acyclic, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Have solved this, the relationship between device, uh, well, between various items. You have to do the same with hardware. Uh, GraphQL obviously will help with that. I'm not selling you a product on that. It's how we solved it for the airport where everything was part of a family and it was easy to find the manual for things that you deployed, which was important because when hundreds of people work on the same hardware project, you kind of end up in a situation where you always need the one thing that you didn't document. And at least if you can point to the, the schemas and the wiring guides, that helps. Figure out those relationships as you're building more and more hardware. Obviously, as software engineers, we know to document our code, and we also do it really, really well. I've, I'm, personally, I've never met any software engineer who would not put a lot of um, codes, comments in their code. Can't imagine anyone here um, struggles with that. So when you're building stuff with hardware, use the same mindset. Dash dash verbose is not just for your software, it's also very much for any hardware hacking you do. You'll find out that pin three and pin seven are actually pretty much giving you the same options, which is nice when you connect pre-built sensors that actually fit better in the case that you design and now have 10,000 units off because you thought that the calculations were correct. It helps having all that stuff documented because for the next time you're buying that many cases Maybe you can 3D print them beforehand, before sending off the order, and improve from there. Hardware hacking, sorry, hardware engineering, software engineering, in this case, definitely network engineering as well, is never just an individual thing. It should not be an individual thing. It is very much a team sport. So when you work on projects like this, work with your team. Don't try to be the lone hero because one, there's too much stuff to learn and to know and to have to know, but also kind of lonely at the top. Work with your team. You can definitely be a thought leader and help others improve by bringing your pre-existing knowledge and merging it with the rest of what your team offers. And you'll usually end up with, uh, with much cooler stuff. A lot of industrial IoT projects these days are discovering that, hey, you know what, we should probably hook up our power plant to the internet. Network engineers will tell you that that is a very stupid idea. Um, if you like reading about this stuff, uh, Greenberg's book Sandworm talks about this in uh, 458 pages, why this was a stupid idea to begin with. But it's nice when other people document their failure because that's where we can learn. Because ultimately, Anytime you see something that works, what you're not seeing are the 99 versions that didn't. The displays that we fried, um, e-ink has this very uh, fun effect that if you apply power incorrectly, totally only read this on the internet, this did not happen to us, your square display now no longer is square. Um, it has a little um, black circular spot in the middle, almost as if it got burnt. Again, no first-hand experience because how hard can it be to plug in 40 pins into 40 pins? So, if this inspired you or not, we have some code online. Feel free to download it from github.com slash workload slash badge. That's spelled like traffic or traffic, depending on which pronunciation you prefer. The French one is traffic. 
Uh, we've got the complete code base there, bill of materials, pretty much everything that you need to order. Uh, no referral links, so um, we're saving you money there. And I um, think we have some time for questions. So um, if you have any questions, let us know. And thank you for being here. In the middle of your presentation, you talk about software simulation. Did you ever get to simulate in software your uh, hardware? Uh, yeah, you digital device twins. So question was, did you ever get to simulate your software in hardware? Hardware. Sorry, hardware, hardware in software? In software yes. yes um, digital twins. Um, IBM will sell you amazing products for that, uh, at least according to the packaging. The problem with anything that's a mock is that you have to do a lot of work to make it look like the real thing. Uh, just like fake chicken is not chicken, um, no shade on fake chicken, it just isn't chicken, you end up with something that looks like the real thing, but it's never gonna behave like the real thing. The problem here is also really that you never know how to define the real thing. Uh, when we ordered the hardware at the two seven inch uh, um, size, same vendor, three different revisions, all of them look the exact same, all of them behave slightly differently. That being said, if you're deploying, the, the more complex your deployment, the better it is to have digital uh, twins and device twins. Also, especially if you're doing firmware upgrades, because it's much more fun to um, do step-by-step -step debugging of failed firmware upgrades on virtual hardware than it is on actual physical hardware. And I think there was somebody else with a question. So on earlier in your Nomad config, the time to live and the, the stop after time, are those one after the other or is the two hour concurrent with the four hour? So four hours in that case, let me see if I can go back there because that would be easiest. It was the first line of TTL was four hours, and afterwards... The there we go. Yep. Yep. Sorry. One more. There we go. So Does the TTL here is, in this case, this is a feature that's coming out in... I'm really hoping I'm not screwing the team here, in about four or five weeks. Uh, it already is available in the code, so if you built the binary or the nightlies yourself, it totally works. Uh, the allocation, the job, remain scheduled for four hours, but after two is considered stopped. That's because we actually don't expect it to come back, and in our case, this config is specific to our badge, so it doesn't really matter if it gets unscheduled. The beauty of e-ink screens is also graceful degradation. Stuff keeps working, even without the, the compute. Uh, if you're actually doing edge deployments, work with basically figuring out, is it okay to, uh, to stop? How much data can we store in the device? What's our reconciliation if the device comes back? Great question, by the way. Go ahead. Uh, as a long time DEF CON attendee, I'm used to various sorts of electronic badges. Did you consider other applications for your electronic badge, games or the like? You wanna give this one? <laughs> Do me a favor, um, can you repeat the question a little louder? Uh, as a long time DEF CON attendee, I'm used to electronic badges for the conference where usually there's some sort of game or other interactive element between attendees. Did you look into doing anything like that or have the badges communicate at all? We looked at a couple of other badges. Uh, we started out with these ones. Um, I think the we discounted nine segment displays pretty early on uh, just because we were, we wanted to do more silly stuff, which is, you know, figuring out the math for uh, drawing all the shapes that you see on there and really hating that part. Uh, there was a lot more hardware that we could have used. Next version we're working on goes a little off the deep end. We're adding a fingerprint sensor. Um, 
because, well, currently the badge, if you take my badge, then you have my badge, versus if you take my badge and you scan your finger, print, um, the hash of that, if shown in our device or in our um, secret storage, will actually load your specific details. So there's definitely new things that we are evaluating, and there's also other badges that we want to learn from. We have, um, especially with uh, the 2.7 um, inch hardware, we've got four buttons on there that we're not currently using. We're basically overpaying by five bucks because, I mean, those four buttons are amazing uh, to do even more stupid stuff, like why don't we use one of those to shut down or reboot the device? Uh, why don't we you know, do other things? Uh, there's endless amount of silly and um, educational that we could, uh, could be doing. We haven't figured out all of them yet. But good ideas are always welcome. I think we had a question here. E fishery. It's, a, it's, it's an impressive project where somebody more or less in a week built the first prototype, then got some farmers interested in the idea. I mean, if you're operating a fish farm, of course you will want to know if the water you have for your like, money producing um, workers is actually good for them. And they ended up commercializing it, rolling it out across the country. It's it's definitely a feel-good story, uh, irrespective of the hardware that's being used, irrespective of what they're doing. When you write code that eventually helps solve food shortages and you know, helps people to be more efficient in how they farm, that's always good. I'll, um, I'll give you a link uh, later. Any more questions? If not, Adrian um, is around. Uh, definitely feel free to ask him questions about the train and how he uh, learned from that. And to touch the hardware if you want to. You can come in and see the front if you want to. Thank you.